7th, 1941. In the end, Japan paid dearly for its ambition, and American armed forces avenged their shame at being caught unawares. With the end of World War II, the Soviet Union emerged as America's most threatening adversary. The Soviet detonation of an atomic bomb in 1949 and the sheer size of its armed forces kept the United States military in a perennial state of alert. In July of 1952, during the administration of Harry Truman, Washington, D.C. appeared to be the target of airborne intruders. But the prowlers weren't Soviet fighter planes. They seemed to be UFOs. Perhaps the most important sighting of all time was the so-called uh, Washington merry-go-round. On two weekends in 1952, July 19 and 20, and July 26 and 27, UFOs were tracked by radar and seen by numerous individuals over Washington, D.C. and its environs. People at Andrews Air Force Base and at Washington National Airport went outside and could actually see objects in the sky that matched positions of blips on the radar scopes. And the net result of it was, for a couple days there, UFOs seemed to have had their way over the skies of Washington. On the third day of the sightings, as operators tracked the mysterious signals, curiosity suddenly turned to panic. The objects were heading toward the prohibited airspace over the Capitol and the White House itself. The Pentagon ordered jets from an airbase in Delaware to intercept the intruders. Al Chop was the Air Force's civilian spokesman on UFO issues. He was called to the radar room at Washington National as the dramatic incident unfolded. We were observing about four or five known flights and about 12 to 14 UFOs. And uh, we saw the flight coming in from Delaware. We could see them on the radar scope. And the, the moment they came on the scope, all the UFOs disappeared. The fighter planes patrolled the empty skies for some 20 minutes but there was nothing to intercept. However, when the jets returned to base, the UFOs promptly reappeared on radar. And then when they came back, <laughs> after the intercept was left, the fact that they immediately came back on the scope, uh, I was very apprehensive. Again, jets were sent aloft. One pilot reported seeing the UFOs, which he described as blue and white lights. Then he reported that they were closing in. We could also see them on the radar scope, and we could see his return and the unknowns grouping around him. And he said, they're all around me. And uh, then he said later on, what shall I do? Well, I just, what could we tell him? After a few minutes, the UFOs pulled back and then disappeared. The standoff was over. However, the extended episode had stunned the nation. That sighting has never been adequately explained. Because it happened in Washington, D.C., it uh, alerted everybody right on up to the presence of the United States and caused a, a national press conference by the chief of intelligence of the Air Force to try to calm everybody down. We have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion. And that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. General Sanford went on to explain that the sightings were merely an atmospheric anomaly, an inversion layer. Radar signals had bounced off this layer and picked up ground images of cars and buildings. Somehow, experienced radar operators at three different locations had misidentified them as UFOs. The press dutifully took down the story. They bought the explanations. 
It was still standard practice, and it was for many years, to accept whatever the government said about flying saucers, no matter how foolish it was when you looked at it carefully. The people at Washington National Airport and at Andrews were expert radar people and personnel. They had been there for many, many years and could easily differentiate between ground clutter and true metallic objects. I mean, if they couldn't, they, they shouldn't have been radar operators. The senior radar air traffic controller at Washington National Airport, Harry Barnes, wrote his own account of the so-called Washington merry-go-round. He describes the objects as making right angle turns, as hovering, as uh, reversing their course and moving back upon their path. One radar tracked the objects as moving at approximately 7,000 miles per hour. He had never seen objects maneuver like this in his years of being over a radar scope. He didn't know what they were. There were a few others who did not believe the objects were simply a product of unusual weather conditions. At that time, I was convinced that these things were interplanetary machines of some kind, mainly because of what happened that night in the radar room at Washington National Airport. I'm convinced that those objects were real. We don't know what they are, and we don't know where they come from, but they are there. Of course, it's entirely possible that the military didn't really believe its own explanation of the UFOs. No fighters could catch up with these things, and they outmaneuvered the best that the military had to throw at them. Obviously, the people who were in charge of Air Force projects and Air Force intelligence at this time were not idiots. They were very, very smart people, as they are today. And I, I think they probably thought once they appeared on Washington, oh my God, this is, this is the holiest of holies. Now they're hovering around the White House and the Capitol. What can we do? Well, the answer turned out to be that they could do absolutely nothing. But it probably had to uh, provoke a whole lot of consternation in, in the official quarters. I can't believe that they wouldn't have been interested in, at some level, trying to find out what is going on. It's a national defense concern. There was a technical report that said it's the most classified subject in the United States, even more so than the H-bomb. That's going pretty far. That's taking it very seriously. In the decades after the Washington National Incident, aerial sightings were reported more frequently and all across the country. Some episodes were even recorded on tape. Dark 05, 327.1, 327. On March 25, 1995, three crew members on America West Flight 564 saw something unusual in the sky over Bovina, Texas. Texas 564, go ahead. Yeah, off to our uh, 3 o'clock. Get some strokes out there. Can you tell us what it is? Right now, I don't know what it is right now. It was 10.25 p.m. and the plane was cruising at 39,000 feet. The crew kept their eyes on a large object with flashing lights visible below them. When they turned west, the object turned too. Here is the actual conversation between the flight's first officer and air traffic control. 564, did you pay that object at all on your radar? Uh, Cactus 564, no I don't, and uh, talking to the three or four guys around here, no one knows what that is, we've never heard about that. But nobody's painting it at all? Okay, Cactus 564, say again. Uh, there's nothing on their radars on the other thinners at all on that uh, particular area, that object that's up in the air? Uh, it's up in the air? A permanent. No, uh, no one knows anything about it. Eventually, the object moved in front of an active thundercloud. When lightning flashed, the crew got a better look. What's the altitude about? I don't know, probably right around 30,000 or so, and it's a uh, drill that starts from going uh, counterclockwise, and uh, the length is unbelievable. The airline crew was seeing something that ground radar was not picking up. Air traffic controllers alerted Cannon Air Force Base in eastern New Mexico to check if military aircraft, or perhaps weather balloons, were known to be in the area. Cannon 21. 
Cannon, go ahead. Hey, do you guys know if there was anything like a tethered balloon or anything released that should be above tie band? Uh, no, we haven't heard nothing about it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, guy at 39,000 says he sees something at 30,000 that the, the length is unbelievable and it has a strobe on it. Uh-huh. This is not good. <laughs> okay. uh, what, what does that mean? I don't know. It's a UFO or something. It's that Roswell crap again. The desert just outside Roswell, New Mexico, was the site of a mysterious aircraft crash in July of 1947. Some 50 years later, the name Roswell had become synonymous with UFOs. And like Roswell, the experience of Flight 564's crew is still unexplained. Though crew members stick to their story, they prefer to remain anonymous. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of hesitancy about even reporting something like this, even in FAA, even in military. They're going to think we're crazy. I don't want to be grounded. I'm risking something here. And uh, a lot of airline pilots feel that way, too. Why should I report this? I don't want to be under a medical microscope here. I'm not losing my mind. Airlines don't like to employ people who see strange things. If you are, have a reputation in your company or your Air Force squadron as being the guy who saw the, the UFO from your F-18, uh, I'm not sure I want to fly wing with him, you see. It's a subtle thing. Um, Again, it goes back to denial. It's easier just to deny it and to say, all right, he's an oddball. Well, she just saw something that just couldn't be seen, so she's probably not as reliable as she should be. The fear of ridicule or retribution has kept many UFO eyewitnesses silent. Still, some do step forward, at times with extraordinary revelations. Shag Harbor is a small fishing village on the east coast of Canada. It is a peaceful place where the locals focus on the sea, not the sky. But in 1967, a dramatic UFO incident upended Shag Harbor's quiet ways. It was October 4th, 1967, when two of the townspeople en route to their homes spotted something strange above the tree line. My friend and I were talking as I was driving and all of a sudden my friend said, look, look at those lights in the sky. When we first see them, they looked like they were stopped. Of course, we were driving in the car and we couldn't tell if they were stopped or, or if they were moving or what they were. And after we lost sight of it and we ran around the corner, we gained sight of it for a few more seconds, then we lost sight of it again. I know I was scared when I first got out of the car because I wasn't very long, very long getting into the house. Like, to, to get my father and, and get him to come out and have a look at it. And I was kind of hoping that it would stay there long enough for him to see it, and it did. And I come home and I told my mother about it, and first question, of course, was you drinking? And I said, no, I don't think so. Smith and Kendrick weren't the only ones to see the strange lights. Many of the locals watched as they flickered off and on. Suddenly, the luminous object turned on its side and plummeted into the harbor waters. Eyewitnesses rushed to notify the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP. The people who initially arrived on the scene, the civilians who were called in the aid, the RCMP, uh, concerns were for survivors. Most people saw this thing occur from a distance, and it was initially thought that perhaps it was an airplane crash, but what the eyewitnesses saw, or in this case, what RCMP officers saw when they arrived on the scene, I mean, there were at least three officers on the shoreline that at least saw a pale yellow light moving on the water. They all felt that it was something quite unusual. The RCMP officers were not alone in observing the mysterious object. They were surrounded by a small gathering of spectators. And we all seen it, the police seen it. And everybody was, I guess, startled by it. And nobody had, none of the people that were there had ever seen anything like it before. And I, had, I know I hadn't. The witnesses stood and stared, mesmerized by the strange light on the water. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the light vanished. A Coast Guard cutter was summoned, but local fishermen, already on board their vessels, headed for the spot where the light had last been seen. 
They were looking for survivors, but the only clue that anything had happened that night was a thick layer of an unknown substance. There was a great bubbly foam, and it was yellow. Nothing I had ever seen before. You couldn't smell no odor or anything. And we went about probably three lengths of the boat, and we ran out of it. And we turned around, turned the boat around, and came back into it, and we ran out of it again. The foam, like the lights, eventually disappeared. When it was obvious there was no further sign of distress, the search ended for the evening. By the following morning, the RCMP had already made contact with nearby military bases. They were hoping to find a reasonable explanation for what they'd seen. There was none. This left the small town of Shag Harbor to become big news. It's a headline story throughout the North American press and beyond. And uh, in that, it was said quite clearly there were statements made by the personnel at Canadian Forces Headquarters in Ottawa saying that, yes, indeed, we are searching for the crash of what we believe to be an unidentified flying object. This is one of those rare cases where something indeed real has gone into the water, and it's not an aircraft, and it's not space junk. This was a, an official statement. Canadian Armed Forces clearly stated that the object was officially a UFO. But the question of where it went after hitting the water was still a mystery. Canada's Department of National Defense was determined to find out. Military authorities ordered an underwater search. Within hours of the sighting, a Navy diving team was bobbing off the shores of the tiny fishing village, scanning the harbor bottom for debris. Meanwhile, Shag Harbor residents were stunned by what was happening in their small town. Those who had been the first to witness the lights were quickly gaining notoriety. Everybody teased me a lot about seeing Martians and all this stuff, but I, I believe I see something. I did see something. There's no question about that. And uh, what it was that I don't know, but it was something. It was definitely something. The people of Shag Harbor had no expectations. Roswell, although it occurred in 47, uh, did not become, uh, you know, a, a story and a case until al almost into the 80s, at least until 78. And they weren't influenced by that. This uh, Shag Harbor stood alone. Nothing was found during the Navy's three-day vigil. On the 8th of October, the search was cancelled. Media interest began to wane, and life in Shag Harbor settled back to normal. But researchers now claim there is more to this incident than originally revealed. 26 years later, the case was re-examined and unofficial information began to emerge. The men from the original Navy diving team were the first to talk, and what a story they had to tell. These men are claiming uh, that there was a second operation, and their story has been corroborated by other armed forces personnel that it, this UFO did not stay in the Shag Harbor area, but got away under the water and went up the coast and came to rest near Government Point. Now, at Government Point, you have a secret base. In those days, it was an American base on Canadian soil. Uh, to have uh, an unidentified craft of any type sitting very near this facility and on some of their detection equipment would be a matter of extreme concern. The Shelbourne military base at Government Point is now closed. But at the time of the sightings, it was a first line of defense against Soviet threats. Here, American forces monitored for submarine activity using a sensitive underwater grid According to the unofficial story, an object triggered the detection device and a flotilla of Navy vessels responded. From our best information, six to seven ships um, camped over the object for about a week, keeping an eye on it. Divers went down on it. Um, one diver in particular makes no bones about it that uh, this thing was, a, you know, was a, uh, an unidentified flying object and there were things on it. And as the men put it, there was still activity in these crafts. And they're absolutely certain that uh, it was nothing from this earth, that it was a UFO. 
So uh, this does go beyond the official record by quite a stretch. According to researchers, other eyewitnesses have come forward, making this story difficult to dismiss. So what evidence do we have of this happening? We have uh, three to four people that tell us the story that this did happen. We've got the integrity of the witnesses, but that's, you know, we you, witnesses are, uh, we don't have, we don't have the smoking gun, that's for sure, but I think we got, uh, we probably have the gun, but we just don't have the bullets. The unofficial story may never have confirmation, but it most certainly is complete. There is a beginning, a middle, and according to investigators, a surprising end. One of the things I enjoy most about the story is its end, because I suppose you could say ufologically speaking, it has a happy ending, unlike most of these stories. After these ships sat over this object for a week, uh, the UFOs start moving again while still submerged under the water and move down the coast of Nova Scotia and out into the Gulf of Maine. Once in the Gulf of Maine, they surface and fly away. This was a genuine UFO event. And what does that mean? Yes, it was an unidentified flying object, but beyond that, it means that it's nothing conventional. There are certainly aspects of this that you cannot explain or explain away. There is another episode involving a top secret base, but this time, a high-ranking officer did come forward and sound the alarm when UFOs penetrated secure military airspace. Weather balloons? Swamp gas? A flock of birds? The planet Venus? These are some of the UFO explanations proposed by the military over the years. Ironically, some of the most unusual UFO episodes have been reported by military personnel, perhaps because they are trained to carefully observe their surroundings. Or maybe there is something on military bases that is of interest to UFOs. Of all these troubling accounts, few compare with the experience of two of the world's most technologically advanced countries, the United States and Great Britain. This was Bentwaters Air Force Base, located 140 miles north of London. The Rendlesham Forest stands just outside the base. Bentwaters is now abandoned, but before the Soviet Union broke apart, it was a hub of top secret activity. This was a joint base, shared by both the United States Air Force and England's Royal Air Force. It was also a place that played host to some of the strangest sightings ever reported. I think the Bentwaters case is sort of a, a mainline, hardcore UFO case because it involves intelligent, educated people who are used to dealing with high technology. They're guarding it and securing it on their own base. They know aviation, they know weaponry with security police who are trained to be good observers. They have to write all kinds of reports and defend what they say. And uh, these people were puzzled, totally baffled by what they observed. During the Cold War, Bentwaters was the largest tactical fighter wing of the free world. Perhaps its most noteworthy period came in December of 1980, when both the military and the local townspeople watched a dramatic UFO episode unfold. Some say it even rivals the Roswell incident of 1947. It was a cool, clear winter night, when suddenly unfamiliar bright lights were spotted in the sky. They um, sort of went up and down and moved sideways. They went this way and that and that and moved about. And this was fascinated. So uh, I opened the front door and walked out into my front yard and to get a better view. And so my house was right at the end of the runway. So I stood there looking at them and I thought, it can't be aeroplanes um, because I'd landed in the forest. 
Suspicious activity around the top secret Bentwaters Air Base was always closely monitored. That night, neighbors could tell that they were not the only ones to experience the unusual episode. I stood there for a few minutes to see what anything else would happen, and I could hear the commotion on the base. The wind was in that direction. I could hear people shouting, calling, and uh, vehicles start up. And uh, I wonder what the commotion was. Three military patrolmen had also reported unfamiliar lights shining from within the forest. They requested and received permission to investigate beyond the base perimeter. As required, the three military police officers filed a report about what they'd seen. I went in to collect the police blotters, the activity from the previous day and previous night, and the desk started, started laughing when I walked in. And I knew something interesting happened, and he told me by name the three individuals and said they were out in the woods chasing UFOs all night and laughed, as though he didn't believe it. The sighting became a hot topic on the base. Though it was a source of amusement at first, the incident was taken somewhat more seriously as the hours ticked by. There was concern in the, uh, the powers to be, so to speak, on the base, not so much from the incident that occurred, but the ramifications and the distraction, I guess is the best way to put it. Because a lot of those security police were regarding some very, very important materials and had a very, very responsible job. In order to get the base back to normal, the military brass dispatched a team of their own police to investigate. They hoped to find a reasonable explanation for the strange lights. But what they found only heightened concerns. The next day, several of the police went out to the area and did find indentations on the ground, and they called the British PCs, the British police, who came out and wrote it off as hens nesting and rabbits burrowing. The interesting thing is there were three depressions which were equal distance apart, and they were all the same diameter, and the ground had been depressed the same depth. Quite interesting. But the story did not end there. Two nights later, the object returned. An American military team responded setting out towards the forest. This time, investigators brought a Geiger counter to check for radiation, plus cameras and a tape recorder. Here is the actual recording of Colonel Halt as he encountered the mysterious object near Bentwater's air base. Suddenly the object, the red object, started dripping like molten metal, just like coming out of a crucible. It dripped for, I would say, several minutes and suddenly exploded. There was no sound, just the poof, and broke into multiple white objects and they all disappeared. Well, we were very puzzled at that time. We really didn't know what to think. In the forest, the military squad detected some unusually high radiation levels. However, they found no other evidence to explain the situation. Then, the team observed a stunning display of lights in the northern sky. The dazzling lights proved to be a mere prelude to the stunning object that appeared in the southern sky. Suddenly, the object to the south approached at very high speed, stopped, I would say, a quarter, half mile above us, I can't really tell for sure, and sent down some type of a beam that fell right at our feet. It wasn't like an ordinary light that fans out. This came down straight like a laser beam. Illuminated the ground, a small circle, 8, 10, 12 inches in diameter, probably for about, I'd say, 10 seconds. Well, I was very concerned then. Are we getting a signal? Are we getting a warning? Or was this uh, some type of a weapon that uh, hadn't gotten us yet? Just as suddenly as it appeared, it clicked, disappeared. Three hours later, the UFOs were gone but mass confusion had taken their place. We were sure nobody would believe this, and I say we were all thinking, wow, how are we gonna cover this up? You know, what are we gonna tell people? We can't tell the British. We can't go back and tell our bosses. They'll think we've all been out here in the woods drinking or something, which wasn't true, but uh, there was great concern. At the risk of ruining his reputation, Colonel Halt reported the incident to a superior officer the next day. He then turned in his audio cassette from the night before. 
After a staff meeting, the officer asked Colonel Holt to discuss the matter with the British liaison. The liaison was out of town, so Holt wrote a memo. I wrote a memo which has become somewhat uh, public, I guess, and uh, kind of cleaned it up a little bit and abbreviated what happened. Later in the night, a red, sun-like light was seen through the trees. It moved about and pulsed. At one point, it appeared to throw off glowing particles and then broke into five separate white objects, and they disappeared. I expected a phone call or somebody to drop around to see me real soon. Nothing happened and nothing happened. You know, days turned into weeks, and I kept asking, well, you know, is there any interest? And it, finally, uh, it just became a non-issue. Bentwater's commanders were content to let the matter drop, or so it seemed. But subsequent events would suggest that both the British and the American military regarded the incident at Bentwater's with the utmost gravity. Shortly after Christmas in 1980, a series of bold UFO approaches apparently challenged the security of a top-secret airbase north of London. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, deputy base commander of the joint American-British outpost, was among the eyewitnesses. However, his reports to other Bentwaters officers elicited no response. Still, there is evidence that the incident was not ignored. Indeed, far from it. The local townspeople were among those who noticed a change around Bentwaters. I had customers come round to my garage who were military men. I asked what was going on. And uh, they said, well, they weren't allowed to say. And uh, I had one or two um, officer customers. And I asked them and they weren't allowed to say either. I don't know why. British UFO researchers Dot Street and Brenda Butler attempted to interview eyewitnesses, but were barred from the base. They didn't say it was a UFO, they said something had happened in the forest. And when we came down and we actually tried to interview people, we, we were just stopped. A breakthrough came for the UFO investigators when military personnel began to reveal a bizarre story that included more than just the sighting. They claimed an alien craft controlled by extraterrestrials landed in Rendlesham Forest and made contact with American officers. These curious reports have been ignored or denied by government and military officials. Despite this dismissive reaction, some say that the armed forces were keenly interested in the events at Bentwaters. People did investigate, they did it from an arm's length. I was never formally debriefed, and I just, I can't, to this day, can't believe that. I do believe some people crept around the base, so to speak. I do believe there were multiple agencies with a great deal of interest that probed discreetly. Uh, I can't explain. I've had people indirectly approach me, trying to pry information out and find out what was going on. Military officials offered only conventional explanations for the extraordinary reports. Among them, that a satellite had fragmented as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. I can't rule out that a satellite didn't fall, or a portion of a satellite didn't fall in that area, but how would one account for the object moving through the trees? And the objects in the sky, they did not fall down, they stayed in the sky and moved about in sharp angular patterns, and there were three of them. And indeed it does seem that some space debris did come through, um, at around about the time concerned. But it should be remembered, of course, that the Bentwaters incident occurred over a series of nights. Another explanation for the sighting was refraction of the beam sent out by a nearby lighthouse. Clearly, something extremely unusual happened. The skeptical explanation that it was the 
uh, lighthouse light reflecting strangely through the woods doesn't make any sense because why haven't they had that encountered that problem before or since? If it's this lighthouse, the atmospheric conditions would have been such that at some other point it would have happened, but it never did. So you have something going on there that is inexplicable in the mundane. You've got very credible people who are charged with guarding a facility who cannot explain it, and if these people are incompetent, we'd better get them out of there. But none of the military personnel said to be involved were removed from the base. And publicly, it seemed both American and British officials were not anxious to pursue the matter any further. The corporate view of the British Ministry of Defense about the Bentwaters case is simply that the case was looked at at the time and was not judged to be of any defense significance. Well, I've not seen that borne out by any analysis. It certainly seems to be uh, an, an example of bureaucracy gone mad if you have something like this happen and people blandly say it's of no defense significance. Years later, the official position concerning the Bentwaters incident was revisited. This time it was brought before Parliament by no less than a former British Chief of Defence, Lord Hill Norton. Either the Americans, and indeed the deputy base commander, were hallucinating, or they believed that something had landed there, and they had taken photographs and records of it. In either event, it must be of interest to the defense of the United Kingdom. Despite such pronouncements, the military kept quiet about the incident at Bentwaters. Oh, well, there's no doubt in my mind it was some type of a cover-up. And I think there were some misleading stories put out. Somebody didn't want the general public to be aware of what had happened. Some two decades later, all physical evidence supposedly gathered during the incident is missing. No photographs have been found, although three separate search teams took pictures. And the military has no comment about the Geiger counter's high radiation readings in Rendlesham Forest. Perhaps the incident at Bentwaters Air Base in December of 1980 will never be fully explained. However, those who were directly involved have reached their own conclusions. I think something totally out of the ordinary happened, something that we don't have an explanation for, and I'd certainly like to have one. Have we been visited? Perhaps. There certainly was some type of intelligent control over what we saw. I don't think there were little green men on board or whatever, and I really can't explain it. I just, I'm firmly convinced there was some type of intelligent control. The baffling episode at Bentwaters is but one on a long list of sightings that seem to merit an in-depth and impartial investigation. Some of the most credible of these reports point to UFO penetration of sensitive defense installations. But there is one place on Earth where military authorities are said to have actually examined alien spacecraft, the forbidden American airbase known as Area 51. The peculiar events at Roswell in July of 1947 seem to have established a pattern for government handling of the UFO issue in the United States. The more officials denied the existence of UFOs, the more it appeared they had something to hide. In the 50s, there was the belief that the U.S. Air Force had proof of some sort that these were alien spaceships and was covering it up to prevent panic. That, in fact, the government not only knows about flying saucers, but is in cahoots with the aliens, uh, that there is a technology exchange going on. In the years immediately after Roswell, the Army Air Force designed and tested a number of saucer-like craft, but none appeared to be of alien origin, nor were they especially flight-worthy. However, in recent decades, suspicion that the government was test-flying captured alien spacecraft has begun to surface again. Attention focused on an ancient dry lake bed deep in the desert of Nevada at the heart of the Nellis Air Force Range. It is a top secret test site known as Area 51. There's a new body of folklore growing up around UFOs 
and this is associated with Area 51, which is part of the Nevada test site. And the story is that flying saucer technology is being tested and flown in extraordinarily advanced aircraft that are being developed there. There doesn't seem to be any question that there are extraordinarily advanced aircraft being test flown there, and this has been going on for some years. Area 51 was the development site used for the, uh, the F-117 stealth fighter. Um, U.S. operated MiGs have flown from that area. These are extraordinary vehicles, and if you had seen, say, an F-117 in flight before it had been publicized, you would not have known what to make of it. Um, it would have been a UFO in a very real sense, an unidentified flying object. The stealth fighter is truly an incredible aircraft which few could even dream of in the 1970s. To observers near Area 51 at that time, it would have appeared surprisingly alien and worthy itself of a flying saucer report. What's really interesting is that as long ago as 1947, people were reporting the boomerang-shaped UFO, which now looks very much like what is being flown as part of the stealth technology. It is interesting that um, certain kinds of aircraft that undeniably exist look very much like what people reported as UFOs for many years. Some believe that the source of such technology is alien. If it is, then many trace the source back to Roswell in 1947 and the government's supposed cover-up of the spacecraft that crashed there. The sensational UFO stories associated with Area 51 have made this remote site a mecca for the curious. Visitors to this spot are monitored from the restricted airspace above and by ground vibration sensors that detect their unwelcome approach. The surrounding mountaintops hold still other devices that scan for any movement below. Once they are alerted, private security forces move in to discourage the curious from getting closer. For those who defy these measures, trying for a glimpse inside, there is one last chilling warning. Deadly force will be used if you come any closer. Persistent rumors about alien technology prompted the investigative arm of Congress to reopen the Roswell case in 1994. The General Accounting Office, or GAO, searched for all records related to the events of 1947 and then issued a report on their findings. The General Accounting Office report is brief, like most of their reports. Uh, and it simply describes what they did to try to discover what happened in Roswell, which was contact the usual suspects, the CIA, the FBI, the National Security Agency, and so forth, and ask if they had information on Roswell, and ask to see certain records there. But essentially, they couldn't find any documents on Roswell at all, period. In fact, the GAO revealed that every document relating to Roswell had been destroyed illegally. When you really look carefully at the phenomenon, there's no question that some UFOs are alien spacecraft, that some government officials have known this since 1947, and this is the biggest story of the millennium. Also, I think we need a new generation of journalists who will give this story the attention it deserves. If we spent one-tenth the effort that was spent on Monica Lewinsky, on getting to the truth about flying saucers. We all know what was going on in six months. Who was responsible for destroying the Roswell Papers? No one has yet been named. But now the years are passing, and those who hid the truth about UFOs may never be identified. Perhaps the more important question is, what were they trying to hide?